good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. How are you, my darling? I am good. How are you? I'm terrific. I'm terrific. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is Sex and Dipity. I'm Dr. Lee Moore Blockman. And I'm Luann Hernandez. How is everything? How was your week? Oh, my weekend was wonderful. I We celebrated Valentine's Day because I'm going to... Um, you do we're, everything pre time. No, we do we do things. We're not on schedule for anything. Yeah, we're ahead of just, time. We're yes. behind time. It's amazing. I so, know. <laughs> he took me to a concert last night Aww. for Garth Brooks. I mean, not Garth Brooks. Oh my God, George Strait. Totally That's different. terrible. Yes, <laughs> I know. Like I would know. <laughs> Whatever the, the story was. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it was just very thoughtful because he knows what a huge country music fan I am, and so yeah, which I, I always find very interesting. It's very odd. It's okay. It's one of yeah. my many interesting qualities. So yes, it is indeed. <laughs> Yes. So um, tonight, um, I'll get to our special guest, but I want to start and open our show. Do you want to tell us what we're going to talk about? We are going to talk about prostitution. <gasps> woo woo! Yes, the <laughs> oldest profession. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's a fascinating topic because I find the whole idea um, about prostitution and prostitutes in general, fascinating because it's so eclectic and it's so different in from one state to another. I'm not talking about the United States, of course, um, mm-hmm. where it's illegal. But uh, we're going to get into it and everything. But um, maybe we should start with our number and just... Start. Oh, yes. If you'd like to give us a call and give your input, our number is 1-800-893-9562. Or you could email us at drlamore.com. Go to contact us. Very uh, good. Yes. Very good. <laughs> and please download and subscribe to us on iTunes. You must. Type in sex and dippity, just like serendipity, but with an X instead of an R. <laughs> this was just fascinating <laughs> and wonderful. You do it so well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start and say that, uh, and I want to hear your opinion about the oldest, oldest profession, but I want to start and say that to me, um, and a lot of um, theorists will agree, that uh, the sex worker is really like just any, you know, general worker. But I believe that in a society where it's illegal, especially like um, here in the States, uh, it's viewed as something that must be titled... In other words, to stop a woman from uh, asking and getting um, a sort of pay that she's interested in is to title her a bad girl or someone that is doing something immoral. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, people look at prostitutes like they're dirty and gross. Right. So this is probably a way and we'll get to the whole dividing of how is it looked at in a a capitalist uh, society and versus socialist And other things. But the thing is, is it really, how do you feel about prostitution? Should it be legalized? Should it be um, legitimized? Is this something that will always take place? How do you feel about it as a phenomenon? Well, I do think that it needs to be legalized. And I do think that it needs to be regulated. And I I think specifically because working with the, you know, working with a lot of young women, especially, you know, as awful as this is, women that are at risk are usually in you know, foster care or have substance abuse problems, the ones that I work with um, yes. outside of here, I see a lot of the girls that I've worked with in the past um, become sex workers, not because they necessarily are wanting to, but because they are brought into it slowly and or I feel, pushed into are pushed it. into it. Mm-hmm. And that I feel is wrong. And I, I think that if there was more regulation, if there were more regulations and control over it, that that it would still happen, but maybe not as often. And there would be some sort of protection for them. So I agree. I agree. I fully agree. I just want to make note of something that is interesting because in patriarchal society, it's interesting. The other foundational contract that the patriarchal society pushes is marriage, Mm -hmm. you know, versus prostitution. And (laughs) well, I'm not sure if it's versus. Not versus. (laughs) Yes. It's kind of in a continuance. You, yes, you, you're going to become you my married. personal prostitute. You get married, you become a whore. Yes, basically. please become my whore uh, in sick and in health, um, sickness and in health. But the thing is, um, 
what I'm trying to say is that that other contract between a man and a woman is being put on, put on a pedestal comparing to, oh. to prostitution that is so, you know, looked at so terribly. But there are just two aspects of the patriarchal society, which is kind of ridiculous that every woman, at least in, in, in the media, is her goal and dream is to get married and to be someone's wife. We're not going to go oh, over don't. how I feel about <laughs> this whole thing. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, one institute in the society is so, you know, glorified. And the other one is so, deme is so demeaning and so bad and so looked at as something terrible and sick in society, which is an interesting thing because it's um, kind of representative of how um, judgmental and how, you know, hi hypocritical mm -hmm. society is. Uh, and I want to bring um, uh, an analysis by uh, Deborah Satz, uh, who is a researcher uh, in this field. And um, she said that there is a difference that before we ask how do women get into prostitution or why, we need to kind of divide things into specific aspects of prostitution. And she makes a point, which we kind of mentioned uh, in our earlier uh, visit, <laughs> to a show, a wonderful show that we visited today. We should mention that in in, in a few minutes. But um, what she said is that there is a major difference between, I don't know, the crack addict or the, the Park Avenue call girl mm -hmm. or, um, I don't know, um, the man that sells, um, that sells sex to other men, mm -hmm. which I'm going to get to because that is a completely divide a different, you know, separated aspect of prostitution, which uh, we hardly ever relate to. I mean, mostly when we think of prostitutes, we think of women, mm -hmm. just, you know, fallen women that, right. that became this, this, uh, this thing. But do you agree that um, one is different from the other and you can't really judge all in the same pot? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, like I, I think of some of the girls that I've worked with in the past who um, either have substance abuse problems or who have um, viewed themselves of having no options. I see those women as very different than the women that I've seen who are high-end escorts. And when How I, are they different? Um, Other than the substance abuse. And the exploitation that usually occurs. That's basically the significant difference. Okay. Is where it seems like, especially the young girls who are, uh, who maybe have the substance abuse problem or who are, like I just said, young girls, they tend to be exploited. And mm -hmm. so to me, you know, that's also one of the reasons why I don't like going to strip clubs. No, <laughs> I don't well, actually, like I it. I don't like it. I'm like, oh, my client. Uh <laughs> <laughs> but, but I no, know. it's like, You know, that's, that's, that's sometimes a the good exploitation. Portion. Yes. It's the exploitation aspect that I think plays a huge role in that. And that I don't, you know, that I think is the major difference. Okay. And, um, you know, it's the high end escorts that I know have kind of owned it and taken it and made it into something that's their own. Okay. You know, um, but the ones that I know that are young girls that start off at like, 13, so it, it's 14. a matter of age as well when you enter that world. Yeah. That's what you're saying? I think that. And I think just also like the way you look at it at different ends. You know, I think I don't think those young girls are looking at it as something of, positive. I of think of a way to at, make money. Yeah. And they're looking at it as survival. Yeah. You know, and that's very different. You're very right. I agree. And um I want to mention, because we're going to go into the whole uh, sex industry and sex work in other countries where it's either legalized or, you know, other forms of, of legalization. And Lenore Menderson is also a, a theorist in this field, and she, she speaks about sex work in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And she, which is, where is, it's very common, you right. know, it's, it's illegal. I have to mention that it is illegal. Mm -hmm. Uh, specifically by law, it's not, it's prohibited, but it's highly, you know, uh, just overlooked and regulated even in some places. And it's very common and everybody knows it takes place, but under law, it's illegal. Um, and she says something very interesting um, that I tend to agree with. She said that uh, for women, the commercial uh, sex work there in Thailand or in these 
countries where it's it's very common um, is a manner of fulfilling a woman's um, obligation towards her family I mean she needs to care for her young or for her elders and mm-hmm. that this is how she chooses because this is the best income she can find because it's it's um, it's different currency and a lot of tourists that spend that money and so it's just a manner of the the best way for her to bring to bring food and to bring money into the family and it's not necessarily anything you know the aspect of the fact that it's a, it's sex work is just random it has nothing to do right. and she uses her body as a product that just allows and enables it and she doesn't really look at it as you know as 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 a she looks at it as a tool to bring that income Right. To the to, family. And not as anything that is, you know, immoral mm-hmm. or a problem. And it really doesn't, what, she, what Lenore Mendelssohn uh, claims is that she doesn't look at it as an aspect of, of herself, right. of the self. Right. It's not, it's not representative of her persona. Right. Well, I think you kind of touched on that too um, when we were talking about women who are strippers who are also uh, students. And right. And how, you know, that other identification of being a student or being... A mother and a provider yes that can save your your sense of self and your dignity when you're doing sex work I think and that's right. one of the reasons I think that's tapping into that psychological element that's taking place that's not seeing it in a negative way the way I think a lot of women can which is why uh, I think that also is part of the element that we were describing of the difference between the park Avenue escort versus the correct you know, the crack, you know, the user. crack user. Yeah, I agree. But what she was saying, Mendelssohn was saying, is that the woman herself is not in search of any other identity. She feels perfectly fine with the fact that she's doing sex work because to her, it's work. Right. But and that's she doesn't I mean. really, you know, she she has no interest in justif- justifying her work. But it's it's what she's, what that kind of also taps into the way you're describing it is yeah. like her role as a provider. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Like that's, yeah, the, that's she could be a salesperson or mm-hmm. a prostitute. It doesn't exactly. really matter because this brings more money. Right. And so this is what she chooses to do. I mean, and what she was trying to mention or, or you know, specify is that because it's in a different society where it's less judgmental and nobody right. really looks down at it. Um, it's fine. She doesn't need a different identity. She doesn't need to be a student and a stripper. She doesn't need to have... Well, I think that's actually... I'm wondering if that's actually true because it sounds like she's yes, seeing it, it as a true. provider. Well, it, is, it is true. And from a personal view of things, I have to say that I visited Thailand a few years ago. Many years ago, actually. Uh, and I really was, was a, a voyeur there. I mean, it was fascinating because... Sex work, sex work is really very prevalent, very common, very uh, everywhere, in every corner, and everyone is doing it. And the thing is, really, they don't take any insult in it. Not to, not, I'm not even going in through into the the market of of lady boys and the whole you know market of men selling sex to men because I want to get to it later mm-hmm. on. But it is really interesting to uh, the different views, and again, that are very cultural. When it comes to it, because in this country, and I'll go into the capitalism versus socialism, it's so viewed as something so terrible and so immoral right. that, that a woman doing it has to kind of justify it to herself mm-hmm. and obviously to other people. But you can't be like a proud prostitute in a manner. Here in the U.S.? Yes, yes. Well, I think that's why they call them escorts. Like, they need a totally <laughs> okay. different name. They need a whole different yeah. name. They cannot be called a prostitute. Yeah, right? and still, high you know, how, girl. Yeah, high and call girl. None of them are sitting with us. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, that's an example of how this work has to be discreet. And nobody can come out with it. Right. And uh, it's, it's kind of shameful still to the woman, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Uh, I just, I came across something that made me laugh because going through the whole uh, prostitution in in the Far East and stuff, I came across a little anecdote from China where, um, you know, when the laws of of emigration to other countries were kind of less less intense there, a lot of women find themselves because, you know, other locations like Taiwan or, you know, these countries, uh, these areas around are more... um, positive in terms of work and, and you know it's very prosperous uh, economics is very it's, it's is better there 
So a lot of Chinese women find themselves wandering into these areas. And there's a term for these women. They call it Dalume. And the Dalume, <laughs> I just have to bring it because it made me laugh. Uh, most of them are... Um, are uh, prostitutes, but they disguise their they they hide their their uh, income, uh, the way of making of making money, by pretending to be uh, first of all natives. They pretend to be um, from there and not from China, and they make most of their money as a singer, waitress, bar hostess, or beautician. And to me, it kind of sounded like it could take place here in Los Angeles. What? No, no. I you may, you don't get no. happy endings here. But- <laughs> You don't that pretend a, to be a, a bar hostess, a singer, <laughs> and you're actually a prostitute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that made but, me laugh, but yeah. it was kind of funny. The Dalume, that's a um, a term there, and there was another term that um, is very common, but I liked specifically the Brazilian term for it, which is uh, I have to say it correctly, prostiturismo. Prostitu- prostiturismo. Prostiturismo. What does it mean? I don't, it sounds like tourism and prostitution put together. Oh, exactly. <laughs> it's sex tourism. Yes. In Brazil. Yeah. So isn't it cute? Prostitutorismo? That's adorable. I know. Yeah. So <laughs> every time I think of sex tourism, all I envision is pedophiles. So let's I know. <laughs> well, no, it's not true at no, all. No, I know. But I'm just saying, like, because in other countries, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, in some countries and Thailand included. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll keep going back to Thailand because it's such a, a common uh, thing uh, that is taking place there. But uh, Chris Ryan, who is a um, um, writer uh, and an analysis of, uh, of uh, tourism and the socialism, the socialist part of it, um, is writing that, yeah, it could be, you know, uh, they could be exposed to exploitation and everything that we discussed it, uh, that we discuss that we sp- spoke about before, um, because a lot of tourists are coming with that view of things. Mm-hmm. But he said that, and and that resembles um, a lot of what I um, mentioned earlier. He said that um, again that the West, it, sex tourism kind of represents um, the Western view versus the Eastern view, the 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 tourist view versus the Thai woman that provides uh, the service. And she, you know, he sees her as he sees sex trade as a way to fulfill his fantasies or you know, to, to to fill some hole that he has in himself or whatever. And she sees his, she's, sees her work as a way to support her family. Exactly. Again, it has nothing to do and with what he wants out of her. I mean, it to has her, to it's just with, going to work. Yeah, it has to do with being a good mom if she has children and getting her job done the same way it would be if you were being, if you were a clerical person. Yeah. Um, you know, or being a good daughter. To provide for her grand or her parents. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, um, I do think that uh, uh, the Western view of things when it comes to sex tourism as well is very judgmental and very, um, very pro um, male dominance. And it kind of gears towards, you know, that satisfaction that a man can get out of abusing a woman in a manner, you know, seen a prostitute as someone I can abuse, I can take advantage of, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of appalled to even see a few ads uh, that advertise sex tourism in Thailand and and the Far East in general. And they used very explicit uh, wording and, you know, the message was in general, and I have to like kind of be specific, specific about it. They said that it was, of course, geared towards men only. And it said, you know, come and, and find our wonderful women because Thai women are the real women because they're submissive. Unlike these North American bitches, you know, the demanding cunts mm-hmm. that really, you know, just are after your money and they're not interested in servicing you. You know. Well, that also kind of plays into the exoticism of Eastern women in general. Well, nothing about that ad was was <laughs> advertising exotic. No, stuff. no, no, no. Exoticism <laughs> is when you kind of view uh, Asian women as being submissive, and North Northern European women, or just Northern and Western women, as being um, uh, dominant or independent. And which the- is true. I mean, obviously, yeah. Obviously, the prostitutes in the United States are much less, you know, giving. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it just, it's a matter of fact because it's a different kind of view of things. But the thing is to really uh, advertise even sex tourism this way. What do you really well, expect to, you know, come out of it? Right. Well, it is, it is also, you know, a very racist thing to do in the sense that they're with the way it's portrayed. You know, it's like I said, it's the, um, like I was uh, explaining, it's the exoticism as well yeah. that goes on between uh, usually typically Caucasian males and uh, minority women. Right. That they have certain elements of themselves, whether it's that uh, Asian women are submissive and giving and all of this type of exoticism. Yeah. Basically, like it's not actually based in, well, it's based in cultural aspects, but of it's course. also, it's just exploiting that part of it. And I think that's also what's playing into that as well. And that's one of the things that is part of the sex tourism where it's taking advantage of women, but in a very racist way as well. Yeah. Um, and that's why they, they put those those elements out there. And that's also this weird, whenever I find people that are very uh, uh, into only one specific type of woman, whether it's an Asian woman or a black woman or a Latin woman, it's not about the actual woman like we've talked about last week. It's right. about this idea of what that would be like. What my perspective of that woman, right. of that type of, that of woman. type of woman. Yes. Uh, very true. I agree. And uh, I want to, uh, in a minute, take our guest and I'm going to let her um, explain about how her very imperative and paramount work that she's doing. But I just want to, um, just a, a quick uh, note that uh, an organization called Coyote, which stands for Call Off Your Old Tired Ethics, which I love, <laughs> yes. uh, is a national prostitutes rights organization that was founded in San Francisco in 73. And uh, I want to welcome uh, our guest. Hello. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Norma Jean. How are you? Hi, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, we're so happy to have you. And, you know, without further ado, I want to <laughs> let you, <laughs> yeah, just tell us. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, first of all, who is the other woman that we're talking to? Well, uh, Luann. I, this I, is Luann. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi. And, and what is your um, interest in prostitution? You do outreach work or? Actually, I am a marriage and family therapist and I currently, okay. actually, I currently work with children in the foster care system, especially a lot of young girls that are at high risk of running away and um, substance okay. abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so how many actual uh, prostitutes have you encountered in your career? <laughs> Not many. Okay. Uh, Not no, many? no, no, no. I was gonna. I'm actually trying to think um, because oh. I work with. Uh, I worked down here and I worked in Northern California too. Um, I probably okay. say around ten. Okay. Ten? Yeah. Yeah. I have. Okay. I have long term. <laughs> sorry, I have long term <laughs> clients. Well, um, the that's the reason what, I ask is yes. because I, I I hear people make such interesting observations about a very small number of people in the sex industry. Yeah. I, I've been an activist for the last. 32 years, wow. and I'm an international activist. I started a nonprofit. Uh, Coyote is a wonderful organization, but it basically came out of my pocket, and my pocket got empty, so I started a nonprofit. And yes. it's called the International Sex Worker Foundation for Art, Culture, and Education, and I work with sex workers around the world. Mm -hmm. And in my 32 years, as you can imagine, I have met, and I know personally, thousands and thousands of male and female sex workers all over the world. And so my perspective, of course, is a lot different from most other people who really have not encountered right. a great number mm -hmm. of sex workers. Yes. And it's just always interesting to hear people talk about this, this whole thing of exploitation. And I'm like, you know what? You guys really don't get it. <laughs> here's the thing. Yes. When you see a client... You know, whether you're a call girl or whether you are working on the street or any of the many other areas and layers of sex work. Yes. When you leave the client or he leaves your house or whatever, you have the money and all he has is a smile. And essentially, <laughs> we have exploited his male need for companionship, for intimacy, and for sex. But sex is really the least part of an encounter with most clients, even though that certainly is the perception people have. Yeah. 
And I don't care whether it's somebody that's working on the street or, as I said, as I worked as a call girl uh, at the very high end, making thousands of dollars and, you know, seeing very few clients a week because I had so many other interests and it basically subsidized my art career, my writing career, and the other things that were important to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when I hear people talk about these words, they bandy them around and they're like, you know, taking all these terms from all the prostitution abolitionists and they're talking about the exploitation and the number of children. And, you know, the thing is, I've been doing research on this for many, many years. In fact, I have a website called policeprostitutionandpolitics.com, and there I have spreadsheets and graphs and charts taken from the FBI's Bureau of Justice Statistics. Wow. And here's the thing. For 32 years, over a 32-year period in the United States, Yes. Female prostitution arrests were 1,954,426. That is of incredible. Of which 35,371 were women. under 18. Oh. Mm-hmm. 35,000 out of a million. Yes. And that comes yeah. to 1.81 percent. Yeah, that's a small Of percentage. all people arrested for prostitution. And the average age of those minors was 17. Mm-hmm. Not, of that huge early, number, yeah. 35,000, mm-hmm. there were 17,000 that were 17, and you go all the way down to, and they were arresting children under 10. And over that 32-year period, they arrested 187 people under age 10. Yes. So it's like people have this idea that it's, you know, these pedophiles going after children And it really isn't. The average age of the prostitutes who are arrested is between 25 and 30. But people are being arrested, women, sex workers, all the way up to their 60s. Yes. And and they're and I know I'm 63. I'm not working anymore. I can't work. I've you know my husband's disabled, and besides which, I I spent 10 years working for the Los Angeles Police Department before I became a call girl. Yes. And I have a lot of physical injuries from traffic accidents that I had while I was working out there at nighttime in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's just not appropriate for me to continue to work just simply because, like an athlete, when you have all these injuries, right. you just don't Absolutely. keep working. Mm-hmm. Yes. But nevertheless, you know, I, the, during the 32 years that I've been involved in the sex industry, and I've certainly I've been speaking at colleges and universities and I do research, because it's really important to me to set the record straight about who we are yes, and how we think and why we get into sex work. And what I like to do is I like to talk to people about, you know, it's like, okay, you think of people as being forced or, or exploited and all this other really nonsense. And I say that not just from my own perspective, but from knowing the thousands of sex workers that I do around the world. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, if, if, if I were really being exploited, I'd be cleaning toilets for a Very living, true. making minimum wage or less. Yes. Now that is exploitation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, Norma Jean, I would like uh, for you to uh, try and really, you know, specify for us uh, why it should be, you know, advocated. I'm sorry, why should what? Why prostitution should be advocated and spoken oh, about? What, what we want is we want to see a system of decriminalization yes. for consenting adult commercial sex. Now, when people say, well, women can't consent, that it's, you know, basically they have no choice. Well, you know what, there's an awful lot of people around the world who are forced to do some type of labor in order to be providers. For their family, oh, sorry, themselves. sorry. Oh, I don't mean to interrupt and you. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Yeah, We're but I think Johnny right is now. working on it. Yeah, please proceed. I'm sorry. No, no, please proceed. I'm sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, anyway, um, it's just there's, there's a lot of people who don't think through their position because they are so 
uh, how shall I say it? They're so brainwashed about what sex work is, how we feel about ourselves, and whether or not no. we're. Uh, Norma Jean, using I'm sorry. Blood. I'm sorry to stop you. It, it must be your line. Uh, do you want to you want to try and hang up and call us back, or we'll call you okay. back in a few minutes? Okay. Well, let me go to a different computer and see if I can, if I can uh, call you right back. Is it the 800 number? Yes. Uh, no. All yeah. right. I'll call you right back. She'll call you back. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, we had a few uh, difficulties, <laughs> but uh, fascinating, right? I mean, the facts yeah. are are very interesting. Um, that really, you know, the exploitation as we uh, discussed. Well, I think that she's also talking from a different perspective as well. Yeah. You know, because there are, I mean, what I'm talking about is the exploitation of young girls. Yes. You know, and I think that what she's talking about, because I, I mean, as far as having call girls or prostitution in general legalized, I think that's a good thing. You know, I yeah. think that's positive. And I do well, have an issue with legalization, a certain... Um, because I, I view it as a different, and I'm going to get to it. Right. But, but which, the, consenting yeah. adults, commercial sex, it's like, um, you know, we just, if that's what people want to do, there's no reason to not do it. Have yeah. a, a commercialized sex work trade. like she's talking about. Yeah, sex yes. trade. Um, yeah, and before, uh, we're going to get her back soon uh, because she has a lot to say, but I want to touch the subject of male prostitution just for a few minutes because I know that mostly when we talk about prostitution, this doesn't come to mind, right. but it does exist and it's not scarce. You know, it's, it, it is there. We, we can find many male prostitutes and um, I want to I wanna ask you, do you think it's a different story? I mean, or how is it different, if at all? <laughs> 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 I, that's an interesting question. I, to be honest with you, I hadn't really thought as much about it just because I don't personally know that many males. No, of course. Or male you, prostitutes. Yeah, yeah, you don't come. Well, and, we don't you know, hire them that often, yeah. but yes. And, you know, I don't know if their clientele is necessarily only men or if it's only women or if it's both. Um, I so. guess we can, you know, kind of separate the gigolos from, <laughs> yes, uh, the, you know, the charm of the Richard Gears of, uh, yeah. But um, uh, scientifically, when it's empirically uh, analyzed, it said that from what you see, most male prostitutes are offering uh, services to men mostly because uh, the market shows that women don't purchase sex that often. What? Yes. Unbelievable, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and it's unfortunate. We should. But, um, yeah, uh, I'll take her in just a minute. Um, yeah, so they don't, they usually offer uh, um, sex work uh, to men. And most of them kind of justified. And um, because we have Norma Jean on the line, so I'm just going to cut it short. But I just want to say that most of them justified this phenomenon by saying that, no, no, we're, we're not really uh, prostitutes. We're just hustlers. And we're just, you know, like to get in the... And a lot of them, it's a cover-up for um, for them to be able to avoid being, cate- you know, categorized as queer or because most of the work is with men. And it, mostly it becomes um, a little violent and less, uh, less advantageous, uh, like in the, the Versace tragedy that you probably know of. So I'm going to go back to it after we take uh, Norma Jean, but let, let, let's talk to her again. Norma Jean? I'm here. Oh, I, good. I still hear a little bit of technical problem, but I, it's probably at your end because this is my landline phone. So Well, you no. sound a little better. So, yeah, let's. Uh, I'm sorry that we cut you off. So let's continue from the point you stopped. Okay. So, you know, uh, the, the, the people that I know, and I'm talking men and women, I'm not just talking female prostitutes. But, right. Um, we do this work because... It allows us to do so many other things that we enjoy. I'm an artist. I'm a sculptor. I'm a cartoonist. I'm a writer. I have a lot of friends that make film and do other kinds of art, uh, do photography. And this kind of income and having the flexibility of the schedule that we can have yes. uh, gives us the time and the money to do those things. But now I understand that not everybody enjoys their work. But I can't imagine how much Definitely. people would unenjoy their work if they had to scrub 
feces and urine and vomit of strangers at hotels. I can't think of anything more degrading or exploitative. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. That. Mm -hmm. And and yet, we don't talk about maids or domestic servants. We don't we don't say, "Oh, those poor domestic servants, we really need to rescue them." And actually, all those kinds I of do. things. I do. They do actually. Yeah. yeah. But well, maybe they yeah, but in a different way, yeah, yeah not in the way, immoral in... way. Yes, <laughs> yeah. please continue. No, I mean, there's no. no moral judgment on them. Yeah. And I think it's kind of odd. I mean, it's like for a lot of us, myself included, we view sex as something wonderful and something that if we can provide pleasure to other people, it's a good thing. And on a scale of 1 to 10, if murder is the worst thing you can do to your fellow human being, yes. give them orgasms has to be right. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. That's on the opposite end, of course. <laughs> yes, le petit mot. Yes. yes. So, it's a different I, kind I, of death. We feel that way. Yeah. It's like to hear people talk about our work that we have to, like, take on different personas. You know, the thing is, when I worked for the LAPD mm -hmm. and in the capacity of, of a traffic officer back in my 20s, yes. I had to take on a different personality because I met a lot of real jerks out there at night time. <laughs> I, worked night, I worked a night shift from 6 at night to 2 or 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Yes. Not only did I meet the worst people out on the street, but my fellow officers were involved in all kinds of nefarious activity. They had yeah. a murder fire ring, a drug mm. ring, a yacht theft ring. The cops were having sex with 10-year-old girls mm, yes. or younger, and they didn't get arrested, nor did they go to prison. Of course. And I had, you know, my fellow officers were involved in, in stealing drugs from drug dealers, and then when they worked off-duty doing security at the movie uh, studios and, and so on, they sold those drugs. To the, to the actors and producers and yeah. writers and everybody else in Hollywood that was using drugs. And, and yet, when you talk about police work and being a, a law enforcement agent, that's, that's a noble profession. Right, there's like, no judgment. Oh, yes. Not so much. Yes. <laughs> now, and, it depends on and who you so talk I, to. <laughs> I look at it and say, I had to take on a whole different personality when I was working for the police because I had to hide the soft gentle side of myself mm -hmm. in order not to be crushed by either the bad people out on the street or the bad people I worked with. Mm -hmm. And in either case, it's like a lot of people have to distance their real person from the work they do, maybe in sex work for some, but not all. I mean, obviously, it's like, okay, you're, you're not supposed to be there to be there for you or who you are. Yes. You're there to provide a certain kind of persona for your client. Right. And that's why they're paying you that kind of money. And, and people think of all these guys that are married. Well, it's not just married. You have clients that are disabled, mm -hmm. divorced, widowed, and, uh, and a lot of men who are socially inept. By that, I mean... Norma Jean, we have a connection blue. problem again, yes, right? I yeah. hear it. See that? Yeah, it's probably us. Uh, I'm sorry. We, yeah, we're gonna have to. Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll we'll put uh, Norma Jean's um, info or email if anybody wants to uh, converse with her about her uh, wonderful knowledge of the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really enjoy talking to her. I'm, I'm sorry that we got cut off, but uh, she's very right. I mean, any form of work. Um, is not being criticized or, you know, the hypocrisy around that is not that intense. When it comes to uh, to sex work, everybody's raising an eyebrow and everybody thinks it's, oh, how, how terrible, the fallen women, you know, that, that ended up there. It's always, yeah, you know. Uh, but I want to talk about the legal matters when it comes to it. So we've established that in, in the United States, it's illegal except for certain rural uh, counties around Nevada where it's mostly regulated in brothels and I have a big problem with it. Mostly, you know, a lot of uh, studies show that the women in these facilities are being abused much more and the regulation of it is a different kind of aspect that is not, you know, not advantageous towards the, the working woman but towards the uh, customer, customer only or the techs, you know, mm -hmm. uh 
or, or for tax pur- purposes. So honestly, it's not really anything that is so uh, it's, it's desirable. Not it's not a woman's rights yeah, type of a thing. It's more of a nobody's like, really thinking of the working woman right. when it comes to these regulations. But I want to just put it into categories and say that um, the three um, the laws of prostitution fall fall into um, three categories. One of them is the prohibition, of course, that mm-hmm. is completely illegal, that nothing is uh, regulated or anything. Then there's the regulation that legalizes, you know, specific forms of whether it is in brothels or, you know, specific ways of that it should be conducted. And then these, there's the abolition that Norma Jean mentioned, and that completely decriminalizes uh, sex work. I just want to mention that in all three systems, uh, pimping or, you know, keeping fees from a woman working is illegal. Okay, in all three systems, it should be heard (laughs) that the idea of pimping is illegal and should be. Um, And under the prohibition uh, form, it should be looked at as either a socialist aspect or a capitalist aspect. And I want to make a note of it because even though it sounds like we do live in a capitalistic, you know, uh, world and in society, and um, it seems like it's always in favor of the person that is working, but it's not Mm -hmm. at all. And unfortunately, I'll start with the socialist view of things. Still, um, in that view of things, either communist or socialist view of things, uh, the female prostitute is still still seen as the victim. And so, somewhat as a victim, and so uh, who is being uh, prosecuted and and pursued is uh, mostly the client, Mm -hmm. who is abusing in a manner... Of, and the socialists, which yes. is what you're saying. Okay, yes. Mostly they're they're chasing the, the, the client and not the working woman, which is kind of, you know, in favor of the woman in a, in a way, because unfortunately, and I'll get to the way it is in, in capitalist uh, society, but um, China and Vietnam are, for instance, two societies where uh, kind of managed to, and I'm not saying whether it's good or, or bad, but I'm, I'm only saying that they managed to kind of abolish, you know, just, eliminate the whole idea of both pornography and prostitution because the market doesn't allow for the specific income or practice of it. And so there's hardly any of it. Now, whether it's good or bad or where does it go, you know, where do you generate, you know, the, the, this, this, uh, this energy is a different story and I'm not going to go into it, but they did manage, both these societies managed to kind of uh, eliminate these two practices, um, where in a capitalist prohibition, uh, the one that he's, he's been pursued, and I think Norma Jean touched it, um, is is the prostitute. I mean, for instance, it's it's a huge waste of resources mm-hmm. when a woman allegedly practicing any sex work, even a call girl, that is someone, you know, someone told somebody and, you know, the word went around that she's dealing with sex work, can be um, attacked at her home by seven police officers. I mean, why on earth would that be needed? But that's the way it is. And mostly the woman is to be accused and to be uh, chased as as someone that is going to be prosecuted and accused and all of the above. And the client goes free, Mm -hmm. which is, um, to me, kind of uh, unfair. And... um, uh, Thai writer Anita Plumerum writes actually something very true. She says that in American society, the society that is mostly in most in the world, it, you know, kind of tuned to the to the needs of the market, is so schizophrenic about providing sex work when it's something that is being, you know, it's a need mm-hmm. that everybody is 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 exhibiting. How come? I mean, it's kind of hypocritical. How do you feel about it? Is that true? Oh, I mean, I think we talk about it every week. Yeah. That we have this idea of be sexual, but don't have sex. Like for women in our society where we talk about how, like you said, how schizophrenic we are about our sexuality. But especially in this capitalistic market. Right. It's, um, I think there's a Nobel, right, a Nobel Prize winner at Stanford, Alan Roth, who refers to it as a repugnant market. Yeah. Like people are willing to participate in it, but we think it's like our society for whatever reason like you said, sees it as so 
disgusting, like inappropriate, not right. Yeah. We don't think that should be we done, mm-hmm. that we stop it. But there are two willing participants. And he also, I mean, he talks about a lot of other things too, like um, organ, sorry, about like selling organs or, um, <laughs> you know, you know, what do they call it? Like dwarf th- throwing or something in different cultures. Yeah. You know, just things along those lines. And this is a similar prostitution, sex work. Like you said, it's a similar market where there are two willing parties. Yes. It's just that our society doesn't view it as appropriate at all. Yeah, very true. I agree. And uh, so we kind of, um, we kind of uh, agree that prohibition doesn't work. And, and when it comes to anything, you know, just mm-hmm. to uh, put something uh, as illegal and, and unallowed is actually going to push, you know, everybody to, uh, to um, take more risks and it actually supports organized crime and exactly. all of the above. And, it, and it's a big problem and it shouldn't be uh, pursued, but it is what it is. Now, in terms of regulation, um, which is uh, legalization of that specific in a way, it would be, um, for instance, how we have it in the States uh, when it comes to brothels or these areas in Nevada, I find it really problematic because what it means is that it kind of uh, represents medicalization of deviance in a way. Yeah, yeah, this is what it represents. And it, it characterizes prostitutes as vectors of disease. Because all they do is kind of, you know, medicalize these things, but they still allow these women to be abused by Johns, by pimps, by mm-hmm. anybody that comes along. And actually, a lot of theorists claim that even though uh, street work seems to be more endangering, unless, you know, because it's not facilitated in a, in a way... Uh, prostitutes themselves claim that it's better work for them. They prefer not to work in a brothel because then they can choose the clients and avoid specific ones that they find problematic or see from afar that is going to be either violent or a problem. Whereas in a place, in, in a facility, you know, prostitution hotel or whatever it is, uh, or a brothel per se, they can't really because they're not allowed to refuse. They're not allowed. They're like, we cannot refuse service to... They don't even have that, right? No. To say, like, we, we can refer, refuse no. service to anyone who wants Yes, them. you're on open. You know, like, you know, the they restaurants. Open. Yeah. yeah, and it's unfortunate because it's a terrible thing. Yeah. But that's what they claim, that the abuse is by far worse under these regulations where they're being protected. And actually, well, nobody's not, really being protected there. Yeah. Other than, you know, the pimps but, themselves. Who well, runs the who ru- whoever runs the show? Right, which isn't a surprise that you know. I mean, it's not a surprise that the people that, like you said, run the show are the ones who are getting protected, yeah. the pimps or the whatever, because that's part of that's also what feeds this organized crime. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's where the money is. Yeah. Like <laughs> so, who have whoever holds the money has the right. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to uh, to touch uh, abolitionism, uh, the third option when it comes to uh, laws of prostitution. It was actually Josephine Butler in the 19th century uh, came up with it. And she said that um, uh, regulation of prostitution is is something that she she doesn't support. And actually abolition is not against prostitution, but against these regulations. I mean, they're not good for the women working, as we said before. And she said that actually um, all these regulation are, regulations are actually supporting pimps, as we said. Mm-hmm. And also they actually um, take the toll off the government and they allow them to um, avoid looking at trafficking and other versions of abusing women mm-hmm. because they claim, oh, we legalized it. Right. So, so now it's your problem. We're not really looking at what's going on. Mm-hmm. And so it should be avoided altogether. I mean, that that legalization, if it's not under the specific rules that she uh, offers, should be completely avoided. Mm-hmm. And it should be said again that under pro, um, abolition, both client and um, prostitute are protected by law. But again, pimps are not. Right. <laughs> and I just want to, again, make sure that everybody understands it. And um, I want to touch a different, um, a different side of prostitution. Uh, 
mm-hmm. which is a phenomenon that uh, started taking place in, um, I think, around uh, the 70s sometime. And uh, it's a phenomenon called uh, the mail order brides. <laughs> you know of that? Of course I yes. do. <laughs> so how do you feel about that phenomenon? I mean, it's fascinating and very sad. Yes. In my opinion. Yeah, it's very weird. I don't mean, I don't know what to, I mean. Is that, is that something that can work? I'm going to, of course. Well, you uh, know what? I think it, I, I think it leaves a lot of room for abuse. You know, yeah. a lot of room for, you know, that's one of the things, one of my friends does a lot of immigration law also. Yeah. And she does, um, she kind of works with women who come here or who, married somebody here right and you know and they were being abused and they're afraid to leave because they're afraid they're uneducated on the laws of our society that you know and also subservient yeah, and exactly. unable to very submissive and yeah. un- unable to most of them don't speak the language and exactly. all of the above it's a, it's it is a way to yes to abuse hurt. women yes yes exactly. uh, and I want to say that it's it's it really is a bad phenomenon I'm, I'm completely against it but I want to say that That especially, you know, um, the locations where it emerges from yeah. is very easy, you know, because of the promise of a good income for the family. Mm-hmm. Again, all these women are participants in, in, in these uh, propagandas and in these, you know, for these advertisements for male order brides. And the main countries that are the purchasers or, of it is, you know, the American society, Australian society. Uh, most of these women are by far younger than the men that buy them mm-hmm. buy that that purchase them and the initiator of it was a man called John Brossard uh, who was actually um he was an importer of, of, of vases and now you know all of a sudden he woke up one day and he said mm, you know what what else this starts with and, <laughs> yeah let's import vagina that would be great yeah. right yeah so he decided to diversify his import and bring women you know and painful to me because uh, statistics show that a lot of them end up in in, in intense violence and sometimes murder and you I'm really not a big supporter of it, but could it really work that someone would buy a woman and she will be a good wife and they can have a good life? I mean, you know, here's the thing. You can say <laughs> like, you're like 99.99% of the time. Absolutely no. <laughs> not. But you know, there's going to be like that one person that's like, it totally worked for me. It was great. You know, it's like an arranged marriage. And in my life, it's so much better. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Because now I can speak English and I have citizenship in the US and like you know so I I mean I personally don't so think doesn't that it should. benefit the woman that is coming because she does learn a language and does make the money that But she can send she? that's the question her family but that's the whole thing does she let's and say she the- does get the money it it still doesn't mean that she's not abused right but is that worth it do you think that a woman like that could be somewhat happy that she's supporting her family even though she's being like treated you Not exactly the way she would like to. I think people have done worse things to support the people they love. Like, I think people do awful things if they really Just are trying uh, to support the people. Just on the altar of, of, right. Trying to protect people, trying to love, you know, trying to so get you, away. I so mean, basically, I'm not saying that it's, do I think that it, it could work out? I really doubt that it can. I think it's just like, whatever, very little of a chance. Yeah. But I do understand why they do it, and I do understand why they would want why would to. these women put themselves in these ads? I mean, because they don't word gets around, right? right. So how I it. mean, it's why do people come through coyotes from you know Mexico to the u s because their options are so limited. So you have to look at what they're escaping too. Mm-hmm. you know there's you don't so come, a woman a fil a philippine a philip a philippine woman woman. would uh, prefer selling her life. whatever life that's what it is to it's marry like somebody right it is a form mm-hmm. of slavery uh, or a Russian woman because these are the two targets mainly mm-hmm. um, would prefer to come to the United States or to Australia and marry a man that she doesn't know and uh, possibly will not like ever mm-hmm. um, and nothing will, will will be in common between them. Just to be able to support uh, her family, but she'll be content with it. Is that possible, do you think? 
I don't know. Contentment is a hard thing to measure. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I'm just true. saying that as somebody whose family did come here and worked very low end and low paying jobs that have, you know, people don't view as having any dignity at all as, um, you know, what is Norma Jean mentioned? Right. You know, having come from families where that, you know, coming from a family where people worked very, very low end yeah. jobs to try yeah. to support it support their family and the people that they love. So, I mean, people do awful crazy things, things, crazy just, things um, just to, to support their, yeah, it's you very know? true. And because we have just a few minutes uh, for the ending of our show, it went really quick this time. I mean, I it didn't even... It really did. Yes. I think. <laughs> yes, I have so much to say. Yeah. But yeah, but I just want to mention a little uh, nugget about that, you know, obviously prostitution didn't just happen and start, you know, oh, in this what? era... No, what? We didn't invent it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it started in antiquity. And actually, there were, you know, in Rome, in ancient Rome and Greece, they had different uh, ranks for prostitutes. But there's a funny story about uh, one of the lower, you know, ranks in hierarchy of prostitution. And these women were called Ali Ikeri. I'm probably saying it wrong. But they were baker's girls, uh, meaning that they would work in a bakery. And they would slip uh, clients in while the bread was in the oven. And um, the claim is that because um, oven in Latin is fornix, uh, that that's the origin of the word fornication. So this that. is an interesting <laughs> thing. They would, you know, you want a bite of my baguette <laughs> kind of thing. So... Uh, It was such a pleasure. Give our number for next All time. All right. It's 1-800-893-9562. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. We it have so much good. to say. We urge you really to write us or call us. And, um, you know, you can also suggest things that you would like to hear about or see specific guests. And we'll try to get it for you. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, there is one thing I want to say. We yeah. have a big holiday coming up on Friday. So happy Valentine's happy Day to everybody Valentine's out Day, there. <laughs> everybody. You should celebrate and have good sex every day. Mm-hmm. Not only on Valentine's exactly. Day. Please. <laughs> This was fun, honey. Yes, it was. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We had, you know, I was about to tear my clothes off. I know. Thank you, everybody. I'm Dr. Limor Blockman. And this is Luann Hernandez. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.